we are going to be talking about e-waste continuing to be an issue worldwide and global data protection requirements increasing rapidly rapidly how can you achieve circular IT management with full compliance I don't know what that means but you do and that's okay so what can be done to shift the trend while upholding the most stringent data security regulations so joining us for this session we have Frederick Forshland Vice President, Enterprise and Cloud at Erasure Solutions, Blanco. Uh, we have Sahid Raza, Director, Security Lab and Expert Researcher, Director of Cybersecurity Unit and Expert at RISE Research, RISE Research Institute of Sweden, and Johan Kahn, a partner at the, advo at the law firm Advocat Firman Kahn, Kahn Pedersen. So I believe that Frederick, you're going to lead the conversation. Yes. Yes, and you're the moderator for this panel. Yes. So indeed. I'll leave it over to you. Thank, Thank you, you very so much. much. All right, and it seems like we have good audio check. Um, we have an interesting topic. We are going to understand how we can both achieve better protection of data making sure that we are compliant but still contributing to uh, circular economy and making sure that IT equipment continues in use. And uh, before I get started we have two very distinguished guests here so I'm going to ask you just to say a few words about your um, uh, current positions and background so everyone has a good context from where you're speaking. And if I start with you, Johan. Yes, thank you very much. I am Johan Kahn. Uh, I'm a lawyer with the Swedish law firm Kahn Pedersen. And I have been working with uh, digital legal issues for a little more than 22 years now. Uh, that would include both outsourcing, clouds, data protection and so on. And Shahid. Yes, yeah, so my name is Shahid. Uh, I'm the head of cybersecurity at RISE, Research Institutes of Sweden, uh, where I have been working since 2008. So I am a technical guy. I have a master's, PhD, docent in cybersecurity. So I'm also an associate professor in Uppsala University. Fantastic. So my answers would be more technical than the legal. So, so I know we have. Uh, uh, a Swedish audience here so nobody will raise their hand and ask I questions but if anyone would feel brave you do have some excellent expertise here so we're more than open for any kind of questions but otherwise we'll keep the discussion going so who of you have heard of GDPR I want everyone to raise a hand because otherwise you've been living on another planet. <laughs> GDPR, the right to erasure, uh, data controller and data processor. We have one of the foremost experts in Johan. So I'm going to start there. Johan, if you would give any kind of advice of sort of the key things to keep track of, understanding what kind of regulatory burden do you need to carry in today's society when you're treating data uh, one way or another? Well, that's a big question. <laughs> As uh, you all are aware, uh, the GDPR is a comprehensive regulation governing any type of processing of personal data. So that means if you are a controller of personal data, you need to be in control of the processing. If you are not, in terms of security, in terms of uh, policy, in terms of um, uh, not fulfilling your obligation in relation to the data subject, you would risk to be in breach of the GDPR and could face some pretty stiff sanctions. Mm. That's the short version. And, and trust me, I've been in this industry for almost 25 years and there has been a very steep progress after the GDPR came into um, uh, to action, even the year before when everyone was preparing, because suddenly you went from 
nice to have to need to have because otherwise it could be very expensive if you are not doing what you should be doing. Um, we're setting the stage here. We understand that GDPR brings a lot of pressure. Uh, compliance is another uh, key word. I'm going to ask Shahid to uh, explore that a little bit further. Yeah, thank you. So, you know, when it comes to compliance, there are typical two ways. So first, you're taking the boxes as a company. Okay, I fulfill these requirements, whether it's GDPR or it's EU Cybersecurity Act or it's NIS 1 or 2. Uh, the other um, is more you provide some sort of digital guarantees, uh, guarantees based on, based on mathematics and cryptography that I have a right to erasure. It's not that I have been verbally guaranteed. I guess yesterday or today there was a big fine in Hungarian bank for the first time on GDPR because they were just listening to the calls and uh, from that call, those calls they uh, understand the mood of a person who they are talking to and then they call back uh, to you know according to the mood they have so uh, coming back to the digital guarantees uh, in G GDPR it's a very wide topic and I mean we can spend uh, hours and hours but if we just touch uh, rise to uh, uh, right to erasure uh, then uh, I mean it's it's all about personal data so it's your personal data should we have uh, or we should be asking this question if someone says, oh, I am, I have a GDPR compliant solution. So do I have a digital guarantee that my data is actually erased? So how to ensure this rather than, you know, just the, the tick box. Mm. For example, uh, there are something called smart contracts. So you, the technology today actually allows you to do that. It's not a fantasy. Uh, for example, if you end up using smart contracts, when you give your personal data to a firm or a company or a bank, then it's technologically possible that you have a key to erase your data automatically if you want. Uh, so, I mean, there, the point I'm trying to make is, 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 is there are a number of regulations made in Europe, uh, but unfortunately they ended up being compliant on the tick boxes. Mm. not in a real digital uh, way where they could be. Uh, we, we can jump into this, but the biggest thing coming from EU now is EU Cybersecurity Act. Some of you might be familiar. So this means that uh, EU and uh, especially ANISA, European Cybersecurity Agency, they are making uh, uh, certification schemes for IoT, cloud and 5G. Uh, this act is, is a Swedish law last year, so it's not uh, that you have to, you know, so this is for the first time that they are saying that you certify IoT, 5G and cloud based on not just tick boxes, but something called ethical hacking or, or penetration testing as well. So you don't buy a drone from a country X like China and end up monitoring your power lines. So this would not be possible in future. So, I mean, industry is not really into in favor of this because it's an extra overhead for them. But the regulations and compliance uh, are very much coming towards uh, strong enforced uh, cybersecurity in Sweden. And RICE is uh, owned by Snaring's department, which is um, uh, a state um, the Department of Enterprise. And it's a state-owned company, a non-profit. And we look at all these things uh, and help uh, Swedish companies uh, mm. on these things. So I think we've set the stage. What we can conclude together after these introductions is that the regulatory burden is increasing. Uh, it is very costly if something goes wrong. It's becoming more complicated. There's more things we need to keep track of. So what does that lead to? What's the connection to e-waste all of a sudden? Well, we understand that we need to protect our data because otherwise it can be extremely costly. So that means a lot of organizations still choose very extreme measures to protect data end of life. If we are decommissioning servers, we are actually seeing a lot of uh, uh, destruction of the actual hardware that has been used to store the data. So a lot of compliance, a lot of regulatory uh, pressure, and you end up 
destroying your equipment just to protect the data because you do not want any data breaches or data leaks. So that's the connection. But with today's technology, there are alternatives and we'll come back to that. But before doing that, uh, we talked a little bit, Johan, before uh, this session about it's not only your intent, what, what you think uh, is a reasonable uh, way to perform. Uh, I tried my best. You actually need to prove that you have accomplished something. Maybe you can elaborate a little bit more on that and how the legal requirements look like. Sure. In Sweden, in Swedish, there is uh, a saying, the tanken som räknas, it's the thought that counts. Unfortunately, that doesn't apply to the GDPR. So no matter how good your intention uh, ha has been, you need to be able to demonstrate an actual effect. So even if you had the intent to, to, to erase the personal data on the storage media that you were decommissioning, you really need to, to um, take responsibility that it's actually done and that it's done in a way that is compliant with the GDPR meaning that the data should not be um, no one should be able to to recreate the data or to access the data the data must be unavailable for any type of access for the future so yeah. very very well put and when we talk about bad habits there's a number of bad habits that we need to stay away from that gives a false sense of security for example one of the biggest players in the industry, Mr. Drillbit. If I drill a hole in a hard drive and then get rid of the hard drive, have I protected my data? Mm, no, I see good uh, uh, head shakes. Definitely not. It made it more difficult to get the data back, but it's actually only where the hole is in the hard drive where you will uh, uh, not be able to get the data back. What happens if I format the computer? All the data can be recovered. There's a lot of formatting still going on. What happens if I take a sledgehammer and uh, smash a hard drive? You can still send it to a forensic lab and they make their magic and they come back with the data. So one of the key things is to know what not to do. And knowing what to do, you often have audit trail as a key component. And Shahid, maybe you want to expand a little bit about the importance of audit trail. Yeah, so uh, m maybe I, I go back to one point mm -hmm. that you raised uh, on deletion. So again, if a great or better cybersecurity uh, is that, you know, this is part of the design from the beginning. If you look at the cloud data, for example, uh, no cloud provider today uh, gives you a guarantee that your data is safe from the cloud provider. Uh, in other words, uh, all you, we cannot put our health data in the cloud because the provider of the cloud can see the contents. Uh, even if you encrypt them, the, the, the point of putting data in the cloud is actually to, to take uh, advantage of the power. So at the moment you process, you unencrypt your data and then the, the cloud providers can see. Uh, on this front, uh, I mean, there are new technologies coming uh, and hopefully it will be part of widespread uh, cloud providers in four or five years, something called confidential computing, which allows you that you are able to store and process your data in public clouds without trusting the cloud provider. So you create some sort of trusted environment inside the cloud and then you process your data. Technologies like this actually solves the problem in a way that your data is still there, but it's garbage you know, for someone. It's mm -hmm. a really, uh, so, so again, the, 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 your data will be revealed only if the technology will fail. Like if the, the, you know, the encryption technology we use today, it fails or the way you manage, you know, keys. So uh, it's, it's very, uh, we, we need to think uh, things in a way that, okay, sh can I, uh, or should I be using the technologies that give me these guarantees at the design time? rather than I'm thinking of uh, destroying the key, uh, the, 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 the disks. Um, 
But sometimes it's also important to keep the data, mm -hmm. you know, uh, to especially uh, if you look at the its panel's context, uh, the, the, the three keywords ESG is the environment, social and governance, you know, uh, defines uh, uh, the future businesses, so to say. So, for example, cybersecurity is also an e ESG uh, metric today. Uh, whether it's a positive or negative. Uh, some people say that cybersecurity is an enabler for sustainability because today we buy a, a phone or a, a, an IoT or fancy smart device and the life cycle is three years. So after three years, we have to, dis uh, I mean, we don't use it anymore, not because the hardware is failed, but the software. We don't have support for updates. And that's primarily because the, the cybersecurity, we, we don't have security updates uh, there, so to say. So in order to, to, to keep this sustainability, cybersecurity is actually an enabler. And we, we have been working on things, for example, where if you buy a refrigerator, a smart refrigerator today, with all connectivity and so on, when you, th there is no way to sell this, uh, you know, because it contains your sensitive data inside. So the Fantastic, very good. <laughs> Thank you. Two very good questions, starting with the um, uh, data breach situation. So if there is a difference in the sanctions imposed, if you have reported or if you failed to report or did it on purpose. So in the first case, um, there is only one breach of the GDPR, presumably, which you report. If you don't report, there are two breaches. First, the one that made you even think of reporting and then the failed reporting in itself. And this, this means that the second situation is, um, I mean, you should never break the law, obviously, but um, I guess a lot of companies out there, they make a risk assessment and they uh, try to assess what is the risk of getting caught red-handed, uh, or will this just pass? Um, that's of course something you have to, to consider, but typically it's better to have just one breach than two from a legal perspective. So that's the first one. And in terms of due diligence, um, I think it really depends on the situation. Let's, um, let's say that we have a situation where someone is buying decommissioned hardware and um, want to make sure that it's all clean from personal data, for example. Uh, and um, they fail to, to discover personal data on the hard drives, even though they tried. That doesn't really matter, unfortunately. So if they buy the hardware, they start to use it, and it turns out that it contains a lot of old personal data, they would in fact be the new controller of that data and it would be most likely an illegal processing because they would have no reason to process that old data. So it's really a matter of um, the actual effect of the due diligence. And I can tell you that uh, we spoke about this example beforehand, a good question that you brought up. We actually see some organizations that are so security aware that even when they buy new equipment, they sanitize it, which is the technical term used in the industry for erasing it. They sanitize the system before it's taken into use. And then it's sanitized again at the end of the life cycle, just to make sure that there's no 
spyware Trojan or something that's coming with the system from uh, uh, some sort of uh, uh, attacker or that it uh, contains data. Uh, one study that was done just a year ago, uh, someone went out to buy uh, hard drives, secondhand hard drives on eBay, only from professional vendors. All of them stated that there's absolutely no data on these drives. They have all been erased. After running recovery software, 67% of the drives still contain data. So you really need to know how to do it. But the good news story here is that with today's technology, you can run perfect uh, erasure and sanitization using software, providing you with the audit trail, proving that you have done things in the right way according to all the different standard requirements, etc. <coughs> uh, and another thing that's really important is that it happens immediately uh, and that you can prove that it has been no unnecessary delays, for example, because what do we think about delays, equipment lying around with data on it when it comes to a legal perspective? Johan. Well, that's uh, very important because uh, there is uh, a basic principle in the GDPR saying that data may not be stored or processed longer than necessary for the purpose for which it was um, collected. So that would actually mean a problem and just storing data passively would still be processing in, in the sense uh, processing is defined in the GDPR. So every day that you do that without it being necessary is a breach. Yeah, you're increasing the risk profile of something Indeed. that could, could go wrong potentially. Yes, question. Yeah, you, you're not allowed to keep the data for longer than necessary. <laughs> That's the simple answer. <laughs> Yeah. No, it's difficult and it's a very common question that we get. How long are we allowed to keep the data? Let's say a customer that hasn't engaged with the company for a period of time. Do we have to, to erase it or not? And it really depends on the circumstances in the specific case. If it's a customer in the sense that they have bought a car or a house, something big, uh, that would imply that you're allowed to keep the data longer um, and there would be maybe actual reasons like warranties or things like that. But if it's someone who bought a pair of socks, I would say you, you would have to delete the data pretty, pretty soon after the transaction. And I actually have a good recommendation there and it comes from the legal side of the industry. There's uh, a company that has been established out of uh, Netherlands called File Keepers. You should look it up because it's founded by lawyers that actually realize that a lot of companies are asking, but how long should I keep this data? What's the data retention here? They have scanned all the laws from each individual individual country thinking about HR data, thinking about financial data, thinking about transactional data. So they can help you categorize in this jurisdiction, this kind of data, this is the data retention legislation that you need to live up to. It's a extremely fast growing business. Uh, I can strongly recommend them. They're really good at what they do and exactly helping with the kind of question that, uh, that you brought up. Um, another question, fantastic.
That's an interesting question. Yeah, I, yeah. Should it's I take that? No, uh, it's just go a ahead. quick uh, comment on this. Uh, I mean, it's a legal question, so you should answer that. But it's more uh, generic question is uh, supply chain and the GDPR, you know, so who is liable? Uh, and I'm also very interested to know this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good question. <laughs> well, the, the one who's liable is the one processing the data. So it's not the manufacturer. It's mm. the actual processor, the controller of the data is always liable. So even if I use this device from Apple and process data, I'm liable. I'm the controller. So that's the short answer. But then the long answer would be that when manufacturing a device like this, you have to, 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 to uh, consider privacy by design, and that's addressed in the GDPR, but that's more in order to make your device attractive on the market because the customers are supposed to, to require uh, well-designed devices. So, yeah. But I, I can end with a good note here. We're running out of time, but I can tell you that the industry has evolved a lot. Uh, when I started 20 plus years ago, there was a lot of manufacturers that actually had poor implementations of different security components that are required to achieve data sanitization, for example. But today it's a mature industry. You have um, hundreds of millions of drives uh, being securely erased using software technology that has been proved uh, by governments, certification institutes. So you have a lot of comfort and trust in what the industry can uh, uh, deliver today. And I think that's where we end because with today's technology, you can actually achieve secure sanitization without destroying equipment. And there we have the main theme of, uh, of today's session, that we can be fully compliant, we can achieve all the requirements, but we do not have to destroy the equipment. And if you have any more questions, don't hesitate to grab us. We're still uh, hanging around after uh, the session for a little bit. And the moderator. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for this panel. Lots to think about. Everybody here because they want to innovate forward, but also important to eliminate behind. As you go, like eliminate data and, and uh, what do you call it? Attack vectors behind Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Because you, Risk know, you can really like you're just running forward and creating a huge mm. set of attack vectors and uh, non-compliance issues behind you. Mm. So really great food for thought.